Hi guys, welcome to the Revive Stronger podcast. I am your host as always, Steve Hall, and I am welcomed by Paul Safarini, or Safini, sorry. Um, I want to make sure I'm saying it right. Is that right? Uh, Serafini. <laughs> Where's that, good, where man. is that based? Uh, it's Italian. Italian, I thought it was. I'm not Italian though. Oh so. no, disappointed now. <laughs> <laughs> so some of you might have heard about Paul, uh, Paulie Rocket over on uh, Instagram. I've kind of spoke to Paul a little bit here or there over on Instagram and he's doing some really interesting stuff and I wanted to share that with you guys. That's what the podcast is all about, kind of sharing great information with everyone and Paul is doing some great work at the moment. So a little bit of background about Paul. He has a BS in exercise science uh, and is a graduate research assistant at Kennesaw State University it, and he's doing that in hypertrophy, protein and nutrition. So he's doing some really exciting research and that is what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, but I said to Paul, I don't have a lot of background about him and I was doing some research to try and find more, but I I failed. So I was going to let Paul kind of, if there's anything more you want to expand about your background um, for anyone listening to this, you probably can't see how massive Paul's delts and traps are, but they are. So he's a bit of a bodybuilder himself, but uh, without further ado, I'll let you hit the floor, Paul. Yeah. So um, I am currently getting my master's at Kennesaw State. Uh, I've been involved in research now. God, I got involved in research back as an undergrad. Um, and you know, my earlier stuff working with my professors was more geared towards high intensity functional training. Um, and then now I've kind of had the opportunity moving forward to do a little bit more relating to like the resistance training and bodybuilding, kind of what revolves around my thesis. Originally, I actually did come on as a research assistant to um, do some because you mentioned the protein metabolism. But uh, that was an endeavor that actually fell through and didn't get that opportunity. But uh, and then. Other than that, I do quite a bit of online coaching. Um, so there's, you know, I have, you know, my company, Empirical Training and Nutrition, but my biggest focus lately has been uh, Gifted Performance, which is a coaching group uh, with my coach and a couple other really smart guys um, and coaches. So. And do you yeah. compete yourself or have you competed before? I actually haven't. Um, mm -hmm. Years ago, I was super, super into the whole, you know, natural bodybuilding community. I mean, back when I first got into, uh, you know, discovering like Lane Norton and the science aspect and getting into, you know, finding upper anemias. Uh, but I got pretty burned out early on and kind of took a step away. And so actually, you know, beginning coaching again and, uh, you know, a lot of the recent endeavors of the past year, I've sort of kind of refound my, I guess, little love for bodybuilding. And the goal is uh, upon graduation to kind of finally, you know, take that launch and do that first show. No, I think that's smart that you're not, you're well, you've got your priorities straight. I think it's a bit ambitious to try and get like a master's and compete, taking yourself to that sort of level of leanness and stuff doesn't kind of allow for the most uh, functioning brain. <laughs> Oh man, dude, it's an, it's crazy man. because you know outside of my thesis, you know, obviously there's coaching and I've like full stacked list of clients, but I've transitioned a little more away from the research recently, and now I have like a teaching load at Kennesaw um, with uh, the strength and conditioning practical lab. So there, uh, there's a lot going on. <laughs> so in terms of this actual study, which is what we're going to talk about, um, you're. Tr well, you kind of put it to me as you're designing a study to push forward a bit on getting more literature on failure versus non-failure training. And this is something that everyone listening, their ears have now pricked up. Um, so if you want to kind of first introduce the study, what you're looking to do, um, and then we can dig in from it. Yeah, so uh, it's an acute study. Um, essentially, I'll be looking at two different bench press protocols. Uh, one will be 80% five sets, every set to failure. And the other will be using a um, protocol where they do the same load, 80%, but they stop that first set where they feel they're about three reps in reserve, three reps shy of failure. Whatever number of reps they get for that set, they continue for the next three sets and then their last set they'll take to failure. Um, and then with that, uh, we have about 
we have three days of post testing where they come back and we take blood uh, for measures of muscle damage, creatine kinase. And we also uh, do our performance measures. So we'll take 80%, we'll hook up a 10 unit to it, which is used to measure uh, power velocity and uh, measure uh, 80% done with triples to look at that, you know, performance recovery aspect. And that you said it's an acute study. So it's um, how, how over how is it just that one off session they're doing and then you're measuring after that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically like a time course to recover. So cool. yeah, very, very short. Yeah, cool. And the participants, they're trained or who are you looking to do it on? Yeah, so um, I used uh, how I kind of did this was there's a minimum of three years of training experience, requ- experience required, but I use the uh, class three classification system of the USPA, United States Powerlifting Association, uh, which is what you know, they need to, you know, move forward to go to nationals. Um, and roughly that bench press would be about uh, 1.5 times body weight. Okay. Which is a pretty decent yeah. bench press. I will say that um, with how crazy things have been with recruitment, I'm on the fence of decreasing um, the strength requirement to get studies in. So I don't know, you know, I'm sure a lot of the listeners, they've never really done research themselves. Um, and so recruiting can be insane. Uh, I mean, especially when you talk about the convenience of, you know, most studies are done on university campuses. Um, so you're recruiting, you know, across the university at the gym rec. And, you know, so you have people that are mostly between the age of 18 and 23, average body weight, uh, you know, maybe 165, 170, and you're asking them to bench uh, 250 or something, you know, and uh, it becomes pretty difficult. But, you know, they're recruited quite a bit of, uh, well, I don't want to say quite a bit because I still have uh, a lot of participants to get through, but some, some pretty strong individuals for sure. Yeah, I was going to say one and a half times body weight bench press. That's a good, that, that's good bench pressing that's not just yeah. you there's not that many guys in your local gym that's going to be doing that unless you go to like a bodybuilding gym uh, so yeah. yeah that's i can see that being difficult and how many participants are you looking to recruit um 15 but cool. it's a crossover design so the end size is 30 okay cool and then from the study i guess do you have any hypothesis of what you expect to happen already or um, yeah, do you have any inklings into what you think you're going to see? And then from that, what implications do you think that has for someone training? Yeah. Oh, I forgot to mention uh, one comparison we're doing as well as uh, volume. So that is one of my, you know, expected findings is that, you know, I would expect that the group going shy of failure and taking only that last set of failure to get have significantly greater uh, volume over those five sets. Uh, and I would also expect, uh, for, you know, less muscle damage or or quicker, I guess, clearance of creatine kinase. Um, and then the faster recovery, recovery of performance as well. So, and then does that, I guess, lead into what we currently have, I guess, with the state of the evidence of saying volume for hypertrophy is quite important. And then it would this study may well support the idea of not going to failure as often. Yeah. So, I mean, essentially that, uh, that's kind of the theoretical rationale, um, is that if you can recover, um, you know, faster between sessions or you can fit more sessions in over time because your recovery is better that over time, this is more volume and that in theory you should end with more hypertrophy. You said you kind of dug into the reason this came up is kind of you dug into the failure versus non-failure research and you weren't as convinced or there's not a whole lot of data out there. I don't know if you can kind of summarize what you've seen so far and what kind of people are looking at and what the experts are saying at the moment. Yeah, um, it's actually interesting because um, I think I explained to to you this a little bit um, is that, you know, for, you know, throughout my, I guess my own experience, I think a lot of us come in and we just go straight to the wall 
uh, failure, beat ourselves down. Someone along the way comes along and says, hey, maybe there's a better way. And you start training shy of failure. And I think a lot of people tend to benefit from that, especially if they've been banging against it for a while. Uh, and then, you know, getting involved into, I guess you can say the evidence-based community. I mean, science and bodybuilding and powerlifting has gotten so huge. Uh, a lot of people are behind the, uh, the shy of failure thing right now. And so for myself and coaching, kind of just did it, you know, accepted it as truth. But then eventually I was like, wait, I need to have a reason for doing this. Like if the evidence-based crowd is saying to do this, then there's got to be a good amount of evidence to support it. I need to know that. And so I dug a little deeper and I was like, oh my God, there's not, (laughs) there's not a ton out there. Um, you know, uh, I think I even saw, um, man, I don't want to misquote him, but I believe like Helms did a paper, like evidence-based guidelines or something like that, where, you know, their recommendations, you know, to say roughly most of the time, two to four left side of failure, you know, taking some movements to failure, going to failure occasionally, something like that. Started digging into that a little more. And yeah, there just wasn't a ton there. And so, uh, this study was, um, in some ways very inspired by a previous study where they looked at, uh, I believe it was 75% for five sets of, no, three sets of 10, I believe every set to failure. And then that it was the, uh, like six sets of five and then three sets of five. And, you know, uh, the, every set to failure group, they had, you know, big increases in, uh, creatine kinase. So they had significant markers of muscle damage, um, performance was decreased, but you know, you have the, uh, sets of five at a 10 RM and then, uh, the three sets of five also at a 10 RM and research like this, it's really important because it's done like they're, they're looking to create this effect. You know, a lot of people look at research and they think, uh, it may not answer the type of questions that we want answered, but it, it serves its purpose to be built on, built on over time. And, uh, yeah, so I just wanted to do something a little bit that was something a little more similar to how people are actually training. Like the previous studies just had, uh, a little more, I guess, to be desired. And then there was, uh, it was really funny. Once I started this, uh, you know, recruiting participants and getting started, I think I was even through maybe my first participant. Um, I found a study where, uh, it was kind of a follow-up study to that study where they did different ones, like set to 12, 10, uh, 8, 6, 4, you know, and then every set to failure, it was three sets. And then the uh, other ones were all half the reps. So it was sets of 6 with a 12 RM, 5 with a 10 RM, so on and so forth, 8, 6, 4. Uh, but with their rep maxes, so 8 RM and yeah. Uh, and so that was really neat to see, but still didn't really uh, reflect something a bit more practical, I think, to, to what people are doing. And, you know, especially using the, the RIR based strategy. And so, um, you know, looking at it's been really neat to see Eric Helms and uh, Zordos really put a lot of that into their research lately. And I think lay the groundwork for more of um, the failure versus non-failure research in a way that is a little easier to understand because a lot of the previous research in like failure versus non-failure, they don't really use an RIR based system. You know, you kind of have to, it's kind of frustrating because when you, you sit down and there are some studies that lay it all out, they give you like 12 weeks of, uh, training and they have their percentages lined up and these are percentages of six rep max, but they don't really talk about how far from failure they are. So you have to sit down with your calculator and you're okay. Six rep max, 85%, 80% of that. That's a 68% of one RM or something like that. And they're like, okay, they did eight sets of three. And I'm like, oh man, I could do that forever. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) You know? Uh, So a lot of the research, uh, it's really good research. Uh, you know, I don't like to bash, uh, you know, other researchers because they put a lot of work into it. And just because it's not, the answer I'm necessarily looking for, a lot of other people are looking for, it's still good research and, you know, can be built on. So, uh, 
I feel like I got off on a tangent. Well, it was a good talking, tangent. <laughs> when talking about, uh, you know, when, when people bring up like, well, what's the research say? What's the research say? Let's talk about the previous research. You know, people like me and you, I think we want to know what's better. Some dude goes into the gym and he, he takes every single set to failure, beats himself into the ground versus another guy that's in that uh, four to two or four to one reps in reserve or whatever. And uh, that's the type of question that if you just look right research only, you don't take your anecdotal experience or coaching, anything like that. You just can't answer. Right. You know? So. And I think that's really important that, you don't take things at face level. I know there's been loads of things where I've just been like, oh yeah, someone said this is the right thing to do. So I'll do that. And that's essentially how everyone starts. You read magazines and you just go and follow it and then you educate yourself. So even when you see something being like said as the way to do things by someone who is evidence-based, I think it's important like you did to question it, to actually see, okay, they're supporting this. What are they supporting it with? Is there actually something behind it? Because I think we can even get like we can let people become gurus even though we don't want them to become a guru for us. They don't want to be a guru, but we just follow what they say and we've become kind of, we just kind of follow them dogmatically, which is what evidence-based trainers are not meant to be doing. So I think that's really good. Um, in terms of obviously that's the research side, you're trying to build upon that. With your own clients and with yourself even, you could talk about your own experience. Obviously you said you did the whole failure thing. Where are you? Where did you come from and where are you now? in terms of like what you do for your training? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I've been lifting now for 11, 12 years, something like that. Yeah. I'm, uh, 29. I'll be 30 soon. I started lifting when I was like 18. I was in the army and, uh, you know, especially in that environment, everything's just about working hard. Just grind yourself into the dirt. Uh, and you know, I think like most people, uh, you know, you, you get your new gains, you grind out for a while, you learn something new, then you get a spurt of growth, you grind out, spurt of growth. Every time you learn something new, something gets better. Um, and uh, so, yeah, uh, there, I think there was a point around year three of training. I can't remember how I came. I think somebody told me to just, you know, try training, try failure, and I was just tired of really struggling plateauing. And I just tried it. And I, I started with something and back then I, I had no uh, concept of repetitions in reserve. I didn't know how to use percentages, one RM, anything like that. So I did something that was pretty easy that I could, you know, achieve more reps on each set. And every week I would just kind of add a two and a half on each side until eventually it's like really hard. And, you know, I look back and I'm like, Oh my God, I'm the strongest I've ever been. And, you know, eventually, uh, you know, around five, six years of training, I hire a coach. He's all about failure training. And I kind of go back to just grinding against things pretty quickly. Uh, there were some things improved because he actually introduced me to periodization in some form. Uh, and then eventually, you know, I, I just get really tired. The, the process just wore me out, um, kind of getting prescribed training intensities that weren't realistic and, you know, just grinding against them, hitting failure every session. And so I kind of did my own programming for a while and went back to the, you know, still at this point, no real concept of um, repetitions in reserve the way we know it now in RPE based training, but just with a goal to leave one or two reps in the tank each set and noticed really great progress. And then eventually, you know, all this education goes by you know, I get my, you know, strength and conditioning classes and learn about percentages and I'm following all these, uh, you know, researchers in the field, everybody's talking about programming and uh, have a more refined method now, I guess, in terms of periodization and using um, repetitions in reserve and RPE along with uh, 1RM percentages and stuff like that. So, uh, and it's, and my experience worked out pretty well, especially for a lot of clients. What's really neat to see is, um, you know, because we can talk about beginners all day and it's almost like they can train to failure, get good results. They can train shy of failure, uh, get good results. And you may even argue, well, since they can train shy of failure, you know, they maybe they should. They don't need to work as hard. Um, but 
even having, you know, a lot of people that come to you that are training to failure very frequently, even the advanced individuals, and finally they get some training that's a little more reserved and you almost see this huge explosion in strength. I don't know, like, like a super compensation effect over several weeks, you know? Uh, so I, in general, I, I have been a big fan. I know there are a lot of, there's a lot of back and forth. There are a lot of people that argue that advanced individuals need training that's very close or to failure very frequently. Um, but in my experience, it, it's worked out pretty well. And, you know, if you think about it too, uh, like for instance, I have a guy with a 430 squat. You know, he did an AMRAP a couple weeks ago for like 17. Jeez. <laughs> that's huge. And it's deep. Like he's a, Narrow high bar squatter. He has like the Asian hips. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, you got when you have like people this strong, you know, their loads are so heavy. Like even if they're shy of failure, that's gotta be an insane stimulus. You know, when, when you have 500 pounds on a bar and you're doing whatever, you know, uh, I know a lot of people now are talking about, uh, what, what is it that's popular now? The theory of uh, effective reps, effective reps and sets needing to be within a certain realm of failure. Uh, man, got off on another tangent. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, overall, uh, you know, RIR is something that I use very, um, very much so of my clients, but in different capacities, I'd say as well. So, uh, just like kind of how beginners may need, um, less volume, less hard sets, uh, versus somebody who's maybe intermediate, uh, maybe with beginners, uh, they have a lot more, some maximal sets. So maybe they start at something that's five RIR and they finish at something that's two or three, um, and then over the weeks, this becomes something that is three or four RIR that does finish closer to one or two RIR or zero RIR, or maybe with uh, individuals that are more advanced, maybe every single set is to three RIR uh, for one week of a program. Next week, every single set is to two RIR. It just kind of depends, you know, on the individual because for some people, maybe uh, sets that are five RIR are just not really the best use of time. And so they need more of those right. three RIR sets, you know, or, so if that made sense. Yeah. No, I guess it's, um, you can kind of talk about the stimulus to fatigue ratio of like what's yeah. like, you get loads of stimulus with some fatigue with like two, three RIR, whereas like a fire of RIR, RIR, you get barely any fatigue, but the yeah, stimulus like also is, yeah, it's not so much. So, um, whereas then like you talked about with failure training, obviously there's a, I mean, if you're going to do anything right to gain the most amount of muscle in kind of one day, yeah, do failure training because it's really stimulative. But the fatigue, as you've kind of experienced yourself, is incredibly high. And I was going to ask you about kind of, obviously, you talked about failure training kind of grounded you or grinded you into like the, the floor, basically. In terms of that, what did that mean for you? Did that mean you had to deload more frequency? You saw poorer performance or kind of uh, stay on a, like, yeah, stay on us kicking in sooner. What, what were the problems you were feeling? I think the biggest thing, um, is just hitting those plateaus sooner in training and then getting those decrements in performance as well. Um, because, you know, I don't think like a lot of us would agree that that failure is probably an appropriate tool to use sometimes. Um, so the whole idea essentially is just to, well, I guess you know this, um, save yourself for upcoming sessions, essentially do enough work that is productive, that it's a good stimulus, but you don't jack up your next workout. And so hitting those failure sessions, you know, um, from week one of a training phase, you know, your week two could be awful or your week three. And then, yeah, having to potentially deload more often or just, to me, I, I all, I often would just kind of feel like I stayed in the same place. Like I was always grind. I would come to the gym, grind against the weight next week, come to the gym, grind against the weight next week, come to the gym and then maybe get a decrement in performance, you know, um, versus, and I think a lot of people have trouble with it because they have to check their egos and 
start someplace lower so that they can end higher, but really they just want to stay at that high level all the time and just grind against it. So. Yeah, I absolutely see that. And I guess maybe, uh, and the reason I wanted to ask you about your own experiences, because if there's anyone listening who's like, that's what they're experiencing now, that's kind of, I wanted you to talk through it so they can think, oh, maybe this is for me. And then I guess potentially that is when people move away from the failure training, because I know, like we know, there are people out there who are more supportive of going very close to failure. And obviously this inherently means a lower volume amount. If they're seeing results via that, why would they don't necessarily have the reason to think I need to go back and it might just be a if and when that could possibly occur. Different people are kind of different in terms of genetic makeup, environment, recovery capabilities. So it's interesting to see it because obviously there's yeah. many people doing many things that are working. And the, the most yeah. important thing is you're, you're training hard. And like you said, when you like your guy who's squatting that amount of work, it doesn't matter if he's going to failure or not. He's squatting a ton of weight that's <laughs> going to be causing some sort of disruption. So it doesn't surprise me. In terms of like with your, unless you had anything to say on that, Paul. Um, yeah. And the only thing I'd want to say uh, is that I definitely, that's one distinction I try to make, especially when I'm talking about these things on social media and stuff is that I'm not saying failure doesn't work. That you, I mean, dude, there are plenty of people that, that they live by failure and they get super yoked to get super strong and I can't tell them he's wrong, you know, <laughs> but um Definitely, you know, with myself, a lot of clients, and I think a lot of individuals, especially when the failure doesn't work out, the shy of failure tends to be all, like a saving grace. Almost. Yeah. yeah. So. And then I was just going to say, with your advanced clients who come to you, who have come from that his like that background of always pushing it really hard, and you talked about kind of the ego hit with having to take loads down a little bit. How do you kind of do you have to sell it to them? How do you get them to adhere to it? Um, are there any common problems you see people kind of running into when they do go through it? Yeah. Um, a lot of people, a lot of the people that come to me, they come to me because they trust me. Like they've heard something from other clients. And so they likely already kind of have their buy-in. Um, but it can be a struggle. You know, some people like to overanalyze repetitions in reserve um, because it is, it's a quantifiable number. It's how many reps you are from failure. But I often have to get people to think of it as more of a concept and more uh, like qualitative, I guess. Like, hey, three is you know, medium kind of hard, you know, two is hard, one is really hard and zero is like the hardest thing you've ever done in your life, you know? Um, and so there definitely, there are, I have, it's a certain personality type that it can really frustrate people because they need like a real, how do I know I was exactly there, yeah. you know? And it's like, you don't, uh, <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, if you felt like you worked pretty hard, it was probably good enough. And over the weeks, I'm having you work closer to failure and um, or taking certain sets to failure. Um, and you become more familiar with it. The more times with every AMRAP, um, you know, with every program, because I also have them log um, like their weights, reps and try and perceive their RIR in each set. And so over time, you refer back to old programs. You're like, okay, I got this for 10. That was failure. I need to do this today. Um, I should roughly land in this neighborhood. And then you go by feel. And maybe you do. Or So um, what was the other? I feel like that was a loaded question. What was the rest of that? It was just asking, like, if there was people who struggle with, yeah. like, especially advanced lifters and bodybuilders who oh. love it. They love training hard and they struggle potentially do you ever find they struggle to even leave the reps in reserve they just struggle not to completely take it out um and have you found a way to help them kind of transition into it oh yeah so i mean dude i feel like i have a pretty good success with getting people on repetitions in reserve you know once they get those first you know, training cycle, second training cycle, and they start seeing like PRs and they're not as fatigued all the time. And they actually become more in tune with how they feel when they're under fatigue, uh, you know, because before that's just what it was. That was life. And now they have their deloads and now they have their easy weeks. And then now on week four, when they're taking things to one RIR, zero RIR, they're like, Hey dude, like, I feel like ass. Yeah. Um, I need a break. Uh -huh. And 
But yeah, so after getting the ball rolling, you th- things usually just it is fall into place. Yeah, it's their yeah. thing. Uh, I have had some. Often it's the really gifted guys that you know uh, every set of failure and they're super yoked and they're jacked and they hear what you say like they and they want to but they just can't. <laughs> yeah. you know, like I had I had one off the top of my head. No, two. Uh, one of those guys, it was just gave him his program. Almost everything's a failure. Talk to him. I'm like, hey man, like. You're not doing what I told you to do. And, you know, those guys eventually, they just kind of thought they can't, you know, they can't check the ego. So that, that was one uh, client, for instance, where, you know, he just went back to doing his old thing, didn't even really give it a chance. So, um, but that's pretty rare. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's, it can be really hard for some people psychologically to take it. It's like taking a deload. I think, there's people who can't go into the gym and do a deload. They just need to have days off. And you see that with people and they end up having these protocols where they take days off instead of the gym, which I think is, it's better to, at least, you know, yourself and you know, you need to go and do that. So, um, that's great. And then in terms of the other side that obviously you talked about how kind of evidence-based everyone's kind of, kind of pushing, don't go to failure. Almost some people, you might say they're scared to go that far. Have you ever had clients who don't train hard enough, who you're like, you had to check them um, and how do you identify that and get them to work harder? Yeah, that's a harder one being remote. Um, I am trying to convince more people to send me videos of when like I give them their AMRAPs for instance, or I, I've always been supportive of, Hey, like feel free to send me a video of a set and I'll look at it because um, I also have written like this giant guideline on RIR and how that should feel um, potentially how fast the bar should be moving. Is it slowing down? Has it come to a grinder? Um, and you know, things that people would probably th- even think about, you know, in terms of, Oh man, I, I should probably, cause the weird thing about RIR is, uh, we all, before you know about it, you kind of inherently do it. Um, you'll, you'll hit a rep and you're like, Oh my God, I don't have a spot. I need to put this back before <laughs> I die. Uh but then you ask somebody to kind of do that and they're like, I don't know, like yeah. I could fail on the next rep. It's like forget telling somebody how to walk and then they forget how to walk. Uh, so, um, crap. totally lost my train of thought right there. But, uh, what was the question? So when someone, maybe they're sandbagging because they're scared to oh. go to failure, they don't really know. They feel like they don't, they have no idea where they are in terms of how close they are to failure and, you're kind of worried they potentially aren't working hard enough. You kind of talked about video form, yeah, video yeah. feedback and things. No, absolutely. So, you know, video is one way um, kind of, well, for instance, sometimes some people, because as long as they are working within that, I guess, you know, three to one range, they're still getting good work in. So sometimes I, I still would want to address the issue because I want them to hit PRs on their AMRAP. So I want to see how they're improving. They want to see how they're improving. But for instance, like my, actually my girlfriend is one of them. I can't get her to work beyond three RIR. Like oh, wow. <laughs> I just can't, but she's, she's crazy strong. She squatted 280 high bar ass to grass for like eight reps at like wow. one fourth. <laughs> like, and <laughs> so she still trains pretty hard, but she rarely ever just kind of goes there, you know? So, um, yeah, outside of, you know, the, the instances where you do have the video and you're like, Hey man, you got, you need to work harder. Um, if you need get a spot, um, so that you're not afraid to kind of go to that place. But yeah, to that answer your question. Yeah. And I, and I think it, I mean, you gave a great example of even your girlfriend who is incredibly strong. That's insane strength um, for a female and of that body weight and showing how, yeah, she doesn't even, she's got to that point without ever having to go to the, the point of failure. And I think like we're saying, failure isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's just not a prerequisite to seeing results. 
um, it's definitely not something we have to do. And that's not clear in the literature to say we have to go there. And it's not clear to say that you shouldn't go there. Um, so I think that's been a great discussion. And in terms of kind of future research, I don't know if you're looking to do more or want to look at other things. Have you got anything in the pipeline? For me, well, this is my uh, thesis to graduate. So okay. for me, um, I need a break from academics. Uh, PhD definitely isn't out of the question. Um, but coaching this, especially this past year, uh, over a year, um, has just, it's been great. Like I've loved it. Um, and so my focus largely is pretty much there upon graduation along with, uh, you know, working with my coach with gifted performance and stuff. So that, that has been a really rewarding endeavor. Um, and then, so PhD, that, that's probably later on down the road. So I haven't thought about, you know, any, um, probably won't see more research for me for a little bit. Yeah. I'm, I'm burnt out on it, man. I mean, you know, now I'm in my master's and started research back in 2000. What was that? It was like junior year of my undergrad. So, you know, a year and a half of that. And then did research on my nine months off. Uh, got my first publication as an undergrad during that period, and then uh, this past two years. So it's been brutal. My my body, my I need to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then the only other thing. Well, I, I don't want to finish on this, but I wanted to ask in terms of like your training programming. What have been your like the biggest influences for you? Like who influences you the most? Any textbooks you've read that have been particularly helpful for you? Oh man, who influences me the most? And maybe it changed over time. It, it, it has. It absolutely has changed over time. I remember the first time I discovered uh, five three one. Uh, I was like, "Oh my god, this is how you should train. This is how I'll train forever. Everybody should train this way." And it was like my first time doing any anything, uh, you know, percentage based that was somewhat, you know, kind of had that periodization thing going on linear, I guess. Uh, but, um, and then, you know, I moved forward and discovered some other things. Like I think GZCL was a big one for, you know, some years ago. And then, uh, actually there's a guy, Thomas Neal. He, um, he programs, I know, you know, Mike, I, I'm, Mike and I have never spoken, but uh, his roommate, Charlie. So Thomas does, he's actually a part of our gifted performance group, but he does Charlie's uh, peaking blocks for power. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of what I do now has been uh, kind of inspired by him. You know, things that he's kind of small things he's taught me about programming. Uh, and then I know a lot of his, he has, dude, this guy, it's, insane he just like reads things and, and retains every bit of it and, like knows way more than it, it's weird um but you know a lot of it, so i incorporate some of the rts stuff with you know percent like fatigue drops repeats and um back off sets and you know i do a lot of uh there's some renaissance periodization kind of stuff in there with the rir and uh you know I, i've recently become really fond of the whole just kind of not really having necessarily a rep range and hitting an RIR with every set, which is something I wasn't a fan of in the past. Um, so yeah, it's a mix of, I guess a lot of things I've kind of accumulated over the years as, as things have evolved, you know, it's, it's kind of crazy when you think about it, uh, you know, getting into the gym, reading muscle mags, one body part a week, maybe not even train legs. And then, you know, eventually like some guy tells me, Hey, you should train everything twice a week. And I'm like, that's stupid. I give it a shot. I get even bigger. Uh, <laughs> and then, you know, just how that evolves over time. So Yeah. I, I can remember when people would, I'd got, I got the nickname, the compound guy at my like gym when I was at school. Cause everyone was like, he always lifts compounds all the time. Like, how do you train squats twice a week? I, no one could imagine it. And I was like, I'm not even strong. And <laughs> so, yeah, it's crazy where it, it kind of comes from a point of which you follow programs, you learn yourself, and then you actually start understanding the principles behind them. And then you start using tools from different people and even your own tools, probably, and you create your own system, which is really cool. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's taking bits and pieces from a lot of people. And there's so many, I mean, God, 2019, like PhDs have YouTube videos and, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you can learn really any topic almost yeah. without like going to school. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And so, insane. yeah, you know, picking up pieces here and there. And, uh, cause I remember a lot of my early on, my, my soul training influence was like T nation forums, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and then things have changed so much now. There's just so much great information and it's so hard to even keep track of, yeah. you know, to read the current research. And, uh, yeah, man. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for coming on, Paul. I've really enjoyed talking about the study. Can't wait to hear about the results. Like I said, we might have to get you back on to talk more about it. Uh, it's been really great talking about reps and reserve and your own experiences. And if people want to learn more, obviously you said, you might be fully booked with coaching, but if people want to potentially go on a, a list or anything, where should they reach out to you? Where are you putting out information? I said your Instagram, but if you just want to kind of give people a, a place to find you. Yeah, I'm most active on Instagram. Uh, my website, trainempirical.com, does have a uh, an application that you know shoots everything to a waiting list. I am pretty full right now. I know uh, the other gifted coaches. Um, so um, that Instagram is gifted performance. And so, uh, you know, I've been give, referring a lot of the people I just don't have time for to them. So, but yeah, um, Instagram is a huge one for me. So really, uh, I'm super active there. They can DM me. Cool. Whatever. Yeah. Awesome. I'll make sure that's linked below. Uh, I want to thank Paul again for his time. Thank everyone for listening and we'll catch you soon.